kleine, ich muss so eine kleine Runde machen. Ja, ja, genau. Aber auch nicht ganz, weil ich habe am Montag machen wir ein Interview mit, äh, mit Manfred Zumpe. Wir machen gerade ein neues Buch und der ist jetzt der ehemalige Professor von uns und der ist irgendwie äh, 93. Und äh, mit, in, in das Buch kommt ein Interview mit ihm. Und der hat so der hat super viel Wohnungsbau gemacht und in Ostberlin, so an der Marx Engels Forum und so. Und das ist ganz gut und hier. So, ja, ja, so richtig, so 60er Jahre und, <lacht> und, äh, und, der hat, und der hat so, der hat, und der hat zwei Bücher geschrieben, also sozusagen eins über, äh, so über so, das ist ganz lustig, eins über Scheibenhäuser in den, in den äh, so Ende der 60er, das ist seine Dissertation gewesen und dann eins in Dresden über die Brüche Terrasse, <lacht> das ist dann so das Kontrastprogramm und, und wir haben schon mal vor, also als wir Studenten waren, haben wir Anfang der 90er einen Workshop äh, organisiert und das ging ja dann so rum und dann kamen irgendwie so mehrere Architekten, war auch Käf Christiansen und Willem Jan Neuteling. Und dann meinten die, ah, Sie sind ja Zumpel, Sie sind ja von dem Buch. Und ja, ja, mit dem Buch von der Brüchen Terrasse. Nee, nee, das Buch mit den Scheibenhäusern, das kannten die alle. Das war in Holland das war so, der, so eine Bibel, wo man immer so Typologien rausholen konnte. Und so. Das war ganz lustig. Ja, ja, genau. Ja, ja. Okay, ja, ja, der ist ja bei uns, der, der ist ja einer von unseren wissenschaftlichen Mitarbeitern, genau, der, das ist ja der, der heimliche Professor eigentlich, der, der weiß genau, wie es läuft. Ja, ja. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to our second series in our lectures on concert venues as part of our AAC workshop um, Concert House Stuttgart. Today, today we um, welcome Professor Oliver Till, uh, who comes to us from Rotterdam. Um, and we were just looking into uh, Dresden, where he um, where he's from and st st uh, studied, uh, because one of our workshops also looked into the uh, Japanische Palais, which you very well know as well. Um, Oliver Till has taught all over the place, starting in uh, uh, Dresden, and, uh, but also in Delft and Arnheim and Rotterdam, but also in Lausanne, Düsseldorf, Milano, and uh, Rome, and many more places. So um, we are welcoming a, a teacher whose words we already listened to during the Venice Biennale in 2016 when he came to our AAC exhibition and uh, talked on Kempe Till's uh, housing projects. Today we are looking into uh, concert venues and are very much looking forward to hear what you brought to us today. Thank you very much. And Broad welcome to Oliver.
So thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, can everybody understand me? Loud enough? Okay, very good. Uh, before I start, I take a little bit of water. It's actually good to be again in front of real people <laughs> because I must say the, the last two years uh, this kind of events actually didn't happen uh, so often. And let's say what I, what I would like to do tonight is just to explain you a little bit how we uh, approach architecture in general and how we see the uh, topic of the uh, concert hall. And, uh, but just before I start, I would just say a few words about the office. The office is founded in uh, uh, the year 2000, so we exist now for uh, uh, 22 years. And uh, let's say that the profile of the office is actually nearly strictly uh, focused on uh, Western Europe. We work with about 30, 35 people at the moment, and uh, we work uh, mainly in, in Western European uh, countries without, let's say, one exception. We had a project in Russia, but at the moment that's also, let's say, a bit complicated. And um, let's say, uh, but for us it's important, and that touches already a little bit the issue of the concert hall, that we actually always try to avoid to be specialized as architects. So we think it's not a good idea to be good in something special. It's rather important to, fo we believe, to focus on the, the, the general uh, qualities uh, of architecture because it helps you also to, uh, let's, say in all, let's say on one hand, to work in, in different fields and another, in, on, on the other hand, it helps also to create an exchange between different topics within uh, the field of architecture. We are, let's say, I mean, also like a game pay, I think a typical uh, competition office, so we do a lot of uh, competition and we get something like, I think, 85% of the work by doing uh, competitions. And we work also in Hamburg. Unfortunately, it's dark now, but we have one uh, building site somewhere there, and we have uh, also uh, another project in the, in the Hafen city that I, that I will not uh, discuss further tonight. But what is, let's say, important, I think, in the, in the, in, when you are working as an architect is always to think about what kind of architect you want to be. Huh? That is, I think, uh, I think in, in, in question that should for sure be uh, considered. And for us, there are actually uh, two things that are, I think, important. One is that we all always believe that uh, the typology of a building is somehow the core of architecture. So architecture is not about, uh, not so much about the expression of the building, not so much about the detail, not so much about colors and so on. We believe very much that the, the, the essence of the building is defined by the floor plan and by the section. That, that is uh, one thing and we think that the typological quality of architecture is important because when you see the typology as a sort of prototype that helps also to let's say, uh, create with the architecture an example that can, uh, let's say, realized also somewhere else. And the other issue, and that is also important, is that, but this is, let's say, for, uh, let, let's say a very European uh, uh, point of view. I mean, we are here in Europe. Uh, we believe it's a fantastic uh, continent. And as a European uh, architect, you have to deal with European culture and not only in, let's say, in the contemporary sense of the word, but also, I think, uh, from a bit more general perspective. So what does it mean to be European and what does it mean to be a European architect? And I think this image by uh, Francesco Venezia shows that very clearly. <laughs> so that means the profession is 5,000 years old. We believe in the last 5,000 years actually not so much changed. So per perception is uh, nearly uh, for 99% the same than 5,000 years ago. From a genetic point of view, we are also, <laughs> there is no difference. And because of that, uh, we very much believe that uh, architecture should be about a certain idea of continuity. 
And uh, in our case, it's quite clear, as I already mentioned, this kind of typological approach. Uh, we very much refer to the, to the experience of the Italian Renaissance, for instance, like Sebastiano Zelio, who published this book uh, uh, about uh, uh, typologies. And that was used as a sort of mean to produce everywhere in Europe high quality projects. So for instance, when you go to Amsterdam, Baroque a city extension, 17th century would be unthinkable without the book of Zelio because it was used as a sort of, let's say, manual for uh, design buildings, streets, and entire cities. So that's something what we always keep in mind. And the other aspect is, and that's for us a very important lesson from the Ecole Polytechnique in, in, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, Durand started to basically uh, collect architecture like a biologist. So he just, this is for instance a funny example because these are all uh, theaters. So if you want to know something about theaters, just avoid to look on pictures, but just look on the floor plans because with the floor plans you can find the essence, you can compare, and by comparing, you can uh, learn. And also, you can quality only measure by comparison. So if there are no criteria, you, there is also no argument for, for quality. And what we also like about the approach of, of uh, 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 Durand is basically that he developed basically also a tool how you could design with uh, relatively limited knowledge uh, proper public building, something what we somehow have uh, forgotten as a professional. So when you look at the students at Durand, they were at, at, at probably per year 20, 25, 30 students, 80% of the students were, uh, let's say, after finishing the studies, able to design a proper public building. And uh, I mean, if I look at my students, I would say maybe 20%. <laughs> so you see that also in the way of education, uh, yeah, we are less effective than in the 19th century. And coming back to the, to the uh, let's say, to, to Zelio, this last historic uh, example, what we also think is interesting, that uh, there's always this question we, 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 what people ask us, yeah, okay, but what about the context? What about uh, the site? Uh, you cannot do everywhere the same, that's true. But uh, uh, Zelio had a, let's say, fantastic answer on that. In his book, uh, he uh, worked on very precise definition of uh, typologies, but then he made always a difference. Let's say you see it's nearly the same floor plan, and then he said, this is the, let's say, example you should use in Italy, and that is the example you should use in France. So that's also a similar, uh, let's say, a strategy that we use. So we basically, in the office, we work in different countries. We work more or less always with a bit comparable, uh, uh, let's say, uh, typologies, but the expression of the building, the way how we construct the building is in the place is very different because of the fact it has to do with the context, with building technology, and so on. And uh, what I would like to do now is just to show you quickly um, uh, some examples of how we approach, uh, let's say, uh, certain uh, design tasks. The, the first one is a, a, a little low-rise settlement we just built in in, in, the, in Arnhem, that's on the eastern side of the Netherlands. And the issue was basically here to um, yeah, design something that reflects somehow the suburban experience. So that means a lot of people in the 70s grow up or 60s grow up on, in the suburbs and uh, want to move now into the city. And how can you bring these kind of uh, suburban uh, qualities uh, in a bit more dense uh, situation. And here again, uh, also this project is part of a series of projects where we work with uh, similar uh, topics. And what we did actually in Arnhem was a sort of uh, 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 settlement that is based on a very simple uh, typological setup consisting out of uh, four uh, stripes that form somehow a sort of uh, micro uh, settlement, very uh, uh, classical and the orientation is very simple. This is north, this is south, so this, uh, the house is all facing uh, south side. And as a result, uh, the, the, the north facade is rather uh, close. 
and the houses are in that way designed that they form somehow a sort of a compound, a sort of ensemble within the city that makes, let's say, the project uh, quite, uh, uh, um, let's say, recognizable and defines also a sort of moment of uh, collectivity uh, within the city. And you see the difference between the closed north side and the uh, open south side. And basically the the idea was also very much inspired by Roman typology, so you make a very simple uh, plan. So basically a house, a garden, and then uh, the next house, so you get a sort of grid with a patio-like uh, 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 structure. And uh, from that point on, you try to, to we, we try to, let's say, play with the, with the, with the, with the uh, let's say, housing quality. And uh, that's a bit the situation where you see the, 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 the front side of one house is facing the back side of the other one. That's a typical issue, what you have to deal when you work with this kind of uh, typologies, the access zone. And what for us was especially interesting that we made in the project a difference between, uh, let's say, you could say the structure and the infill. What is something is a, that's a strategy what we use very often and what is, let's say, especially important when you design public buildings or office buildings and so on. So we, we designed a very simple house. It's basically a, a, a box, a 750 by 12 meter. And then you can, let's say, within the structure, offer a variety of uh, typology. And in that case, we designed all the houses together with the future inhabitants and that produced quite some, uh, let's say, uh, uh, fantastic, uh, let's say, housing uh, interiors. And uh, let's say, for us, it was interesting to see that you can, even in a relatively high uh, density, still keep uh, moments of individuality in this kind of uh, structures. And, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, uh, we are not very much interested in details, but details at the end matter. <laughs> so it's more, <laughs> it's more something what you have to do, <laughs> but because of the fact that you have to do it, uh, you also have to like it, let's say. And uh, yeah, in that case, we were dealing with the issue of, of brick. For us, the brick is actually quite a nice material, but we always su suffer from the idea of the dilatation joints because in the past the brick was massive, was used to create massive walls and nowadays it's only a sort of gladding and you have to separate it. And for the issue of the dilatation joint, we, uh, let's say, basically found uh, the Kemper Hill solution, how to deal with that. So we developed a, a brick that you can basically simply stack, but you can uh, make a brickwork that looks very continuous and you don't see any kind of uh, let's say, uh, dilatation joints uh, in, in the brickwork. So you see here, for instance, the difference between a load-bearing wall and a wall that is, let's say, a cavity wall, what is hanging in front of the structure, but the wall itself runs visually uh, through. Uh, when you talk about uh, collective housing, I think the, the issue is always, uh, let's say, where does let's say the, the job of the architect ends and where that does the, the user starts. And uh, in uh, this modernist context, that was always by Corbusier seen as the starting point. Let's say you have this kind of floor plates, you have a staircase and then architecture can start. But uh, in our world, maybe this is already where architecture ends. So maybe that is that what we can offer as a profession and uh, the rest is maybe up to, to the future uh, users. And I think that's also important in, in the sense of the fact that this was, let's say, in the 1920s, a provocation, while nowadays this is basically a way more or less everybody lives in Europe and even on a, on a let's say, a global style, this kind of Bauhaus ideas are uh, exported everywhere. And uh, when you talk about, uh, uh, let's say, housing, 
and we experience that in the moment. There is an enormous need everywhere in Europe uh, for, for new housing developments. Uh, the question of a prototype is, I think, a very important one because you, yeah, you have to repeat uh, uh, always the same, uh, uh, let's say, structure. And why not work on uh, on uh, good uh, prototypes? And in our case, we, uh, yeah, we developed a certain strategy how we, uh, let's say, uh, on one hand can let's say manage the, the issue of economy but also at the same time uh, the try to find answers on 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 the on the ecolog ecological questions and uh, let's say this is a project we built i think it's on more than 10 years ago in the north of the netherlands where we yeah basically try to uh, on one hand to offer a quite a rigid uh, structure that looks say uh, they are also a bit similar maybe to to certain projects by Umos or, or, or uh, Aldo Rossi but on the other hand that offers quite a lot of flexibility uh, uh, inside and the idea here was to uh, yeah, to have a sort of central core combined with uh, daylight in the middle by a sort of huge atrium and then around you have a sort of a zone for uh, for the apartments itself, and uh, the, the the materialization was, was rather uh, simple. Mm -hmm. Social housing, so we have basically that what you uh, anyway have to do is somehow forming the uh, backbone of of the expression of the of the uh, of the architecture and uh, and. We were actually very uh, lucky to to be able to offer this kind of loft uh, uh, like uh, uh, houses for social housing with quite a fluent relation between inside and outside and with rather uh, yeah, details that more or less uh, disappear and uh, and the last housing project I would like to show is uh, is it's basically a mixed use so you, in that case it's already not so clear how public it is or because it's sort of uh, dealing with the with the idea of the uh, classical european uh, city for instance here like in paris where you see that uh, yeah, i would say that architecture public space and uh, and the streets are more or less the same and uh, what, what for us is fascinating that these kind of uh, housing types uh, developed over the last uh, 150 years a quite, of, quite amazing uh, flexibility. So it's basically a sort of infrastructure what you offer, but you can adapt the infrastructure to uh, uh, different uh, uses. And here you see the typical section of the uh, Hausmann uh, Boulevard housing. So you have on the ground floor big commercial activities, then the rich people live on the first floor, and then you go up and it becomes cheaper and cheaper. And that's already a difference, I think, with our condition now, because nowadays it would probably the most expensive apartments, at, at least as we experience, are on the top. <laughs> so you get, <laughs> you get some changes, and that was possible by the invention of the, of, the, of the elevator. And what you also like about this kind of urban typology is that also, the interior is very much related to the idea of being part of the urban space. So the interior is really, let's say, the window is somehow the edge between the private space and the uh, outside space and public space and in the medi mediating between these two conditions at the project. I just would like to show quickly is a project we finished, I think, two years ago in Antwerp. There's a new uh, city extension on the on the Scheldt, and the idea is to develop really a high density uh, uh, quarter, and we build a mixed use uh, uh, block on the uh, central uh, uh, plaza of the of the of the development. And what was for us interesting that um, we could uh, let's say make a block that is on the ground floor, let's say, used for commercial activities. So there are restaurants and a fitness center and 
some other stuff inside and they enclose a courtyard in the middle of the block. Then they are on the first floor uh, offices and then on the, from the second floor on you have uh, uh, houses in, in different sizes. And the idea in general was, and that, that's why it's also the expression of the building, was to bring uh, not only, let's say, uh, or not only remind with the project on the uh, 19th century urban quality of the city of stone, but also to bring in this kind of idea of uh, suburbanity sub and uh, as of a lifestyle that is also much more related to, to the wish to have bigger balconies and uh, outside spaces. And I had it produ produce these blocks that, let's say, on one hand is, let's say, addressing the, the classical European city of the 19th century, but at the same time brings also in a, a sense of, let's say, post-war suburban, uh, let's say, atmosphere. And, and the block is in that case uh, also uh, stacked. So on the front side to the piazza is a bit higher, while on the, towards the east side it's going a little bit uh, down. And, and for us it was interesting because it's, it was, let's say, actually for the first time that we managed to make a building with uh, natural stone. So we have a natural stone facade in combination with a concrete uh, skeleton of the, of the balconies. And uh, now we always thought that might be too expensive, but we have at the moment quite a lot of projects that work with the same, basically, materialization because um, it is for several reasons, also because of for the sustainability reasons, actually quite interesting at the moment to work with natural stone because the CO2 uh, uh, emission is extremely low and because of that it's an all-ranking natural stone is, uh, let's say, the best what you can do. and. And we think it's actually uh, inter inter interesting because it's also very solid uh, material. And here you see some shots of the uh, of the office spaces and the interaction with the uh, with the uh, urban fabric, still partly in 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 in, in, in construction, and uh, a few towards the, the the central courtyard, and then let's say kind of fluent relation between inside and outside and we mentioned for, for the first time to make a housing project where you could move actually 70% uh, or 66% of the facade towards the side by introducing uh, double and triple sliding doors and because of that you have, uh, Naya, especially in, in the summer period, quite, uh, let's say, nice extension of your apartment towards the big uh, balconies and uh, on the top of the project, you you find this kind of uh, let's say step profile with uh, penthouses and uh, let's say huge uh, terraces that make it possible basically to let's say have a villa-like living condition within the city. And let's say when we uh, uh, started uh, the office. Uh, we did actually quite a lot of international, uh, open international competition. At the moment, we are a bit more spoiled, so we do only <laughs> invited uh, uh, competitions. Mm. And the next project I, I show is a little concert hall we built, if, if I remember, like uh, 15 years ago in, in uh, Austria. It was a result of an open international competition. We became actually... Uh, second, but uh, the reason why we won has basically also been to do with the way we operate. Huh? Because, as I said, we always work from a typological way of, of thinking, and we are not so much interested in the, let's say, we, we not start from the expression of the, of the building. And the main reason why we get the commission that we said to the, to the client, you know, guys, uh, if you build a concert hall, there was a negotiation procedure, if you build a concert hall, you know what the most important thing is? The acoustic should be perfect because if, you have, if the acoustic is not good, uh, nobody will come. And, uh, and then they recognized, okay, yeah, <laughs> that's maybe true. <laughs> and at least we, 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 we got the commission. And the funny thing was we got the commission, I think, in... Uh, 
I remember, in February 2005, and the concert hall was opened in, no, in February 2004, and the concert hall was opened in August 2006. So we had five months' time <laughs> to, to design the entire project. We had never done, let's say, a, a public building before, so it was actually quite a pain in the ass. And but for us, let's say, when designing the, the, the thing, we, we started with this idea of uh, slowness. Eh? That was a bit at the beginning of the office. Now we know slowness is the most important thing in, in architecture because, let's say, we are educated in a way that uh, we always believe that the revolution is the most important thing in architecture. Eh? So it was always a bit about breaking the rules, doing something else, uh, being different. And it has also a bit to do with this kind of a bit uh, negative influence of, uh, of 1968 on the idea of architectural education. And uh, yeah, we, we notice and we are quite aware of that, that let's say revolution is not the best thing what you can do in, in architecture, because what is much more interesting is a sort of uh, evolutionary uh, approach and to try to work within a sort of frame and within a cert certain idea of uh, continuity. And for us, let's say, it was quite clear that we, um, we thought that, uh, on one hand, uh, rationalism is something that was, I think, since the 18th century, very dominant in, as part of the European culture. And also related to that is the idea of the classical or uh, neoclassicism. And uh, why is that actually important uh, when you design a public building? We think that when you look on, uh, on, the, on the tradition of public buildings that uh, something like this is, uh, we believe, fantastic because uh, with a public building you can uh, de design an interior that is somehow defining uh, a place that brings in a certain moment of uh, grandeur and that, let's say, when you do it good, people don't want to leave the space. Huh? That is the, it's the absolute power of architecture. And you see it what, when you look back what's happened in the last 20 years, then it's quite clear that someone like Frank Gehry will never ever achieve that because if you only design or if you mainly design, uh, let's say, with a focus on the expression of the building, you I you never get the focus on the on on the let's say on the core of the of the of the of the of the public building. So I think that that was for us let's say that we always keep in mind we always try to work with that and the other thing is that we thought yeah okay what should be the expression of a public building eh? I think and for us uh, let's say and as a German, I think that's maybe also a bit easy. Is let's say, I mean, Schinkel is let's say, from my opinion, let's say the best architect of the last uh, 200 years. And uh, what is what is quite clear is that uh, that the buildings, let's say, the, the building has not. It's, it's not absolutely necessary that the building I itself has a super special expression. But what is important is, uh, let's say, the proportional system and the scale. And by, let's say, working with the scale, and that is, I think in the, in the Altes Museum is a very, really a perfect uh, example, and Mies van der Rohe tried to do, let's say, the same with the, with the Neue Nationalgalerie. Uh, just with the scale, you can very much define the publicness of a public venue. And let's say when we did the competition in Austria, it was, it was for us really funny. It was in a small village, and the only reason why they wanted to build a concert hall was the fact that uh, Franz Liszt, a famous uh, uh, Austrian uh, composer, was born in that village. And it's, it's a rather bizarre situation because they have a village with 900 inhabitants, and they build a concert hall for 600 people. And basically, there's only one public building in the, in the village, and that's the church. And for the rest, there's uh, not so much. So the question was a bit, okay, what to do with that? And it was even more bizarre because of the fact that, let's say, when you look back on the tradition of the, of the, of the, of the concert hall, I mean, the concert hall was in Europe, I would say, invented in the, in the 19th century with the idea to have a sort of alternative 
uh, for, the, for the very dominant position of the church. So it, to going to the concert was also always like a bit, a sort of nearly spiritual uh, thing. It was also a, a moment to define bourgeois culture, and it was especially important in the, in the, in the, in the German-speaking countries because the bourgeoisie was always very much under pressure of the uh, ar ar aristocrats. And uh, let's say uh, going to the concert was in these German-speaking countries also a sort of moment of a sort of, uh, let's say, uh, to creating a moment for the bourgeoisie to, uh, to have an own, uh, an own place. And that was al always related to the idea to build, it, let's say, the most of the concert halls built in Europe on a plaza, so we have a big place, there's a front facade, and you enter. And in, in, in Austria, in, in this small village, we had to build the concert hall in, in a garden. So you see, this is the, the structure of the village, and that's the concert hall. So that was not so easy to say, where's the front side, where's the back side, and so on. So what we tried to do was, on one hand, to create a link with the, with the church, because that was the only public building in the place. So we, we thought, OK, let's make a wide concert hall to bring a bit let's say, on one hand, uh, a direct to, to, to create dialogue with the church, but also with these, let's say, white houses. And on the other hand, the idea was to design the concert hall more like a, a pavilion. So we put the auditorium in the middle, and we organized the foyer uh, around the, the, the uh, auditorium in order to create a dialogue with the garden. And here you see the floor plan. Floor plan is extremely, extremely simple because financial means were also quite uh, limited. So we have the, the auditorium in the middle, I think it's like 12 meter high, and then there's a ring of like, I think, eight meter around the auditorium. And there was also an idea of where to uh, spend the money. So when you have not much money and we are at that time did already a lot of housing, and when you do housing, there's always anyway a lack of money. <laughs> so we had a sort of idea where to, one, where to spend what to get a certain uh, 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 quality. And uh, the result of that was that we had to make, uh, that we calculated already during the competition, we had to make a concert hall with a facade with outside insulation, which is actually yeah, from our point of view, a bit horrible idea. We always try to avoid it, even in housing projects, but uh, there was simply just not enough money to, to have an alternative. And then we came up with the idea to say, nah, yeah, maybe we can use uh, polyurethane coating, what you can use for roofs, also for the facade. And by doing so, you get a bit different expression uh, for the facade. Facade becomes a bit more smooth and you can actually avoid these classical outside insulation details. And that, yeah, I'd say it was at the end was quite complicated, so because we had to do in Vienna uh, some tests to get the, 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 the building permission uh, uh, for that. But at the end, everything all went more or less fine. And here you see a bit the, the, the result. So we have a, we have basically a, a sort of smooth facade without any kind of edge uh, detail, and it looks rather a bit like a, a piece of china or cut tofu, tofu. And and then uh, let's say in the competition already we talked about the idea of the let's say relation between inside and outside, and we came up with actually quite a simple idea. We said, yeah, maybe, I know, when, when the most important thing is, the most important quality of the place is that the concert hall is not uh, on a piazza, it's not in a city, but it's in a garden. That is something what is, what makes this place very special. So when you go there, you go to a concert, but you can also go outside, you are in the green, and that you will uh, not forget, because mostly when you go to, to, to a concert hall, you are in a city, and yeah? that's a different quality. So we, so we thought, OK, uh, what is important is the relation between inside and outside. So uh, we should try to get as much as glass as possible on the, on, the, on the ground floor. And then we came up with the idea to use concrete construction. And we made basically a bridge construction. And that would allow us to make a big opening. 
and then we were sitting in the office, and that I think that you can only do with <laughs> when you do an international competition. And we said, yeah, come on. But when you do a glass facade, then you have the problem that you need, when this is four meter high, you need again a secondary construction to keep the glass, and that would basically a bit destroy the, the panorama. So we said, ah, you know, we can also do something else. We can maybe use also acrylic, because when you use acrylic, you can make huge, uh, let's say, uh, uh, plates. Uh, they are very uh, stiff, and uh, then you don't need any kind of secondary construction, and uh, you have a fantastic view on the on the green. And uh, yeah, then we won the competition, and then everybody said, "Yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> now you have to do it." You know, <laughs> and then. Uh, it was in, in real reality all a bit uh, complicated because we had some issues to solve with the, with the general energy uh, consumption of the building, but the most challenging was actually that uh, when you make windows uh, from, from acrylic, that there is, and in Austria it can be very hot in summer and quite cold in winter, there's a huge delta. So we calculated the delta, and the delta is like six centimeters. So the, 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 the glass plate is moving. And, uh, yeah, and that resulted basically in the, in, in the fact that we had to design the, the window frames uh, by ourselves. And uh, the, the, the acrylic plate is uh, placed on a strip of Teflon and can move into the, into the frame. And then <laughs> in order to bring the, bring the, 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 the glass panes, uh, plates uh, 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 to the side, there was a whole logistics, so there were also discussions, should they, <laughs> should we use a helicopter to bring them from Rasta to the, to, to, to the place, but that was too dangerous, and then the, uh, yeah, let's say we designed it already in the competition like that, that when they are 18 meter long and four meter high, that they fit on a standard uh, lorry, but you had to make a secondary uh, uh, construction uh, to avoid that the, the, the window would break, but then, you see the let's say the window in the in the in the uh, concert hall, and next to it we have let's say and and the glass plates are or the acrylic plates are five centimeter uh, uh, fat, and next to them we have uh, let's say huge uh, stable doors that makes possible to have a fluent relation between inside and outside. And you see a bit of proportional effect. So the house on the right hand side, that's the house of birth of Franz Liszt, that's six meter high. Then this is eight meter and the concert hall is 12 meters. So the scale difference is quite big, but we tried with the elements uh, uh, to bring the things in dialogue. And the strategy was a bit, uh, and we do that actually quite often, and that's for us always a bit, uh, let's say, funny, because the Germans are always afraid of monumentality. So everybody immediately thinks on the Third Reich and, and so on. So that's always a bit uh, scary. But th the funny thing is that when you make the things more monumental, they look more modest because of the fact that uh, visually you have less elements and you always think that the things are a little bit smaller than they are in, in reality. And that you can see, for instance, here you see uh, these big doors, and on the right-hand side, the uh, project leader without shoes, so it was very hot. And uh, so the things or everything what you see is always a bit bigger than you, than you think, and that makes it actually quite uh, pleasant. And that's also a quality we very much like when we go to Italy. Yeah? Everybody is always so excited, for instance, when you go to Rome and then you see Palazzo Farnese by... Uh, 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 Antonio da Sangalo and uh, 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 Michelangelo, but the main quality, on, but nobody, very often people don't get why it is so cool, and the main quality of the building is that the floor height is eight meter, and the eight meters matter, because you have a house that looks like three stories, but it's 24 stories high, so it's basically a tower, but looks very elegant just because of the, of the scale. And, and you see a bit the relation inside, outside, and Let's say what for us was really funny was the, the way how we designed the, the, the auditorium. So to be honest, we are not really big fans of uh, uh, the post-war concert halls. I think that the, the, the Sharon uh, uh, concert hall in, in Berlin, I mean, it's quite impressive, I must say, but uh, was very often copied afterwards. But uh, I think it's nearly impossible to reach the same uh, 
uh, quality. And, uh, and there is also this kind of a bit strange thing about the, the acoustics. Eh? And uh, let's say uh, what, we, what, what we understood is that the, that the, let's say in terms of acoustic, the, the best concert halls are basically the, the, the concert halls of the, of the 19th century, like uh, a Konzertverein in, in, in Wien uh, or the Konzertgebouw in, in Amsterdam. And, and that has to do with the, with the geometric structure. And I think also in, in terms of uh, experience, these uh, uh, concert halls, I think, are fantastic. So I was, uh, this was just by coincidence, but I was last weekend, I was in the, in the Musikverein in Vienna, and I think, yeah, that's such, <laughs> such a fantastic, uh, let's say, thing to sit in this kind of classical space with, I don't know, 2,000 people. That is, let's say, quite quite amazing. And from 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 time to time, you see also that these kind of classical concepts are also, let's say, repeated. And I think the, 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 what for me is extremely funny is the the Snow Hatter Opera House in Oslo, what looks from the outside, uh, yeah, very strange with this kind of landscape setup. And then you come in the middle, you see the auditorium, and then it's a copy of the Opera House in Dresden, in a rather uh, not so inspiring way, and then you then you also wonder eh, wh what is that? At least we, we talked here during the competition a lot with the acoustic advisor, and we design we we, we proposed to design a, a concert hall that was based on these 19th century principles, also because of the fact that we thought it would be nice to realize a space that would be similar to the spaces where uh, Franz Liszt used to play. That was a bit. The, that was a bit the idea, and uh, and we had a very good acoustic uh, advisor for the for the for, for the pro for the competition. That was uh, Pertz from uh, from the Netherlands. They do a lot of concert halls everywhere in the world, uh, but uh, then we uh, let's say couldn't manage to work with them during the execution, and we got uh, Müller BBM from Munich, also very good acoustic advisors. They do also a lot of concert halls everywhere <laughs> in the world. And, and the funny thing was we had developed with, uh, with Pertz a sort of Cartesian uh, system, which was basically based on the, on the, on the, on the length of the, of the noise wave. So we have a grid of a three meter, uh, and uh, that, that is then again related to uh, uh, the building material, in that case uh, wood, because you can get a lot of building materials exactly in that size. But uh, then uh, Miller Baby N came and said, yeah, you know, guys, uh, the structure is fantastic. <laughs> that will, will be, it's, it's a very perfect uh, basis for acoustic, but there is just one problem. Uh, the walls cannot be uh, parallel because you get a sort of echo between between the between the walls, and then we thought, oh fuck, what can we do? Because we really had the idea we wanted to make this Cartesian space, what you also let's say can more or less see in the in the in the uh, uh, music fine in 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 in, in uh, Vienna, and we were wondering how we could could manage to get do these kind of. Uh, three and a half degree movement of the uh, surface within a sort of, uh, let's say, rigid system. And then uh, we developed the idea to, uh, to say maybe we can also use a 3D, 3D tool. So we have everywhere the same joints, but we make, uh, let's say, uh, panels that are slightly uh, uh, curved. And for us, that was actually quite funny because that was shortly after the uh, Biennale contribution from Greg Lynn, who proposed 3D uh, uh, plotting. That was <laughs> at that time the <laughs> hottest thing you could <laughs> could imagine. And uh, let's say basically we lose the similar, uh, 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 let's say, strategy within a rather, let's say, conservative uh, um, uh, concept. And, and that resulted actually in, in that kind of space. So we made a concert hall completely out of wood with a sort of uh, uh, wooden uh, paneling. And let's say the whole thing, the whole building was extremely cheap. I mean, it was at that time, I think, probably the cheapest concert hall built in, 
in, in, in, in Europe. So we had, I think it was 2006, and it was 1,500 euro per, per, per square meter. But still, I think the details are quite nice, and the, the atmosphere of the space, let's say, is also, I think, quite, quite good. And we were quite happy to, maybe we always say, get uh, Swiss details for Austrian uh, uh, prices. So we had also, we found a very good, uh, let's say, wood company, and it was uh, just fantastic to work with them. So it was really a sort of enormous pleasure. Uh, the next uh, project I would like to show is uh, a transformation project, because we do that actually also quite often, that are always projects where you cannot so easily talk about it, because let's say we are still, or we are, when we were students, we were a bit educated with the idea that architecture was always related to to the fact to create a sort of something what is completely new, while the reality, especially in Europe, is rather complicated. Eh? Because the, the, the problem we have in Europe is basically everything is there, and everything we add is a bit luxury, but not, let's say, not really necessary. Eh? So when you have a proper city, let's say, I mean, nearly all, let's say, German middle sized cities, they have an opera house, a theater, one museum, another museum, maybe a third museum. So everything is basically there. And, and what we see nowadays that yeah, there's not so much need for really super big new structures anymore, but it's much more about upgrading, extension, doing extension of an extension, or removing an extension to do another extension, this kind of uh, project. So that's a bit the world we are actually working in. We do quite a lot of public facilities that are related to these kind of topics. It's always difficult to talk about because the solutions are always so special that the question is, what can you learn from that? And I just would like to show one uh, project that's, let's say, a project in uh, Antwerp, again, a bit in the, let's say, southern part of the, of the inner city. It, it was a, comp a competition that we won for uh, uh, the art school and uh, the interesting thing was we had a building from the 1950s was a sort of school for nurses and the nurses left and uh, the artists took over and the question was to transform this building and we proposed basically to knock down the building on the backside and build a huge studio house and to transform the, the rest of the structure and Oh, again, it was also not a lot of money, so we, let's say, invested a, a bit of money to change the facade at the ground floor to open the art school more uh, to the street and create a sort of interaction between inside and outside. And uh, we tried to, uh, let's say, keep a lot of the existing structure and, uh, uh, yeah, you can see, for instance, when you look on the ceiling here, like this is detailed that there was really not a lot of money, <laughs> so we tried to focus on 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 the things that matter, and for the rest we we uh, yeah, kept also a lot of the existing stuff, and uh, basically the uh, we used also a lot of the smaller spaces inside the existing structure and added one big uh, let's say space with artist studios on the backside. And what for us was actually funny was the fact that they, and that's something what is, I think, only uh, possible in, 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 in countries that are not extremely organized, like, <laughs> like Belgium, so they had worked for two years on a space program with the users. And the idea was to realize a lot of spaces of 100 square meter, 90 square meter, 150 square meter. And at a, at a certain moment in the, in the discussion, I said, hey, guys, you look, you have this existing building. There are a lot of smaller spaces. But, you know, I'm also a professor at the architecture school. And let's say we would never, ever accept to make a new school with all these different spaces. And then they asked why. And I said, yeah, you know, when you have one big space, you can organize big parties, exhibitions. You can use the school as a museum. And you can better work with flexible walls. And then the guy said, oh, you mean like uh, Miss van der Rohe? Yeah, for instance, like IIT, Miss van der Rohe. And then the artist was sitting on the table and said, let's do it. <laughs> the project manager from the, from the university was completely <laughs> in panic. But we could actually make a building that is basically, let's say, for big parts, only one uh, space. And we designed it like a 
very simple, like a, like a parking garage. So it's a very fat concrete floor and then in situ uh, concrete walls. The walls are always like 240 high and then you have a band of glass running all around. And you have spaces that you can, uh, let's say, use in a very generic way. We designed also some movable uh, uh, partition walls that make it possible to adapt. But the funny thing is always that when you go normally to the school, it's a total mess because these artists, they, yeah, they don't care so much. They just do their thing. <laughs> but they have every, uh, let's say, every six months, they have a big exhibition for, I think, if two weeks where they show all the artworks and then the, the art school looks like a, a museum and becomes really a public a venue. So a lot of people go there just to see uh, uh, the, the, the production and also to enjoy the, the quality of the space. And for us, it was actually uh, funny that, uh, that the, that let's say the difference between uh, spaces for artistic production and spaces for exhibitions uh, is not so big. So you can uh, basically realize uh, similar uh, qualities within uh, the same uh, structure. That's a bit, let's say, how we work. So we work also with a lot of, lot with models in order to, to get a bit uh, grip on the what we are doing. So it's not only about uh, three D uh, visualizations and so on, but also a lot of hand drawings and a lot of models to, to get a grip on. And uh, yeah, in that case, the the basically we first de designed the the inside structures because art school is rather specific. You need a lot of close wall, but you need also daylight, and then the, uh, yeah. The, the, the internal organization of the building defined the expression on the outside and you get a bit this kind of weird section that you have this kind of uh, glass band where you have in the basement uh, spaces. I just showed them there are these kind of, uh, these spaces are basically underground, but when you are inside, you the, the difference with the other spaces is actually not there because they are quite uh, similar. And uh, then you have always these kind of glass bands and they define the character of the, of the house. So then the next thing I would like to show is again, uh, uh, let's say a, a, a school that is so big that it is basically working like a theater. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what, what is really funny, so we, 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 we work a lot for, for universities and what we actually quite a lot like is this kind of uh, university in Sao Paulo, it's the architecture faculty during the, I think the student riots in 1969 or so 68, where you have, let's say, designed the building to bring people together and where, let's say, a school can be really a sort of uh, a public uh, a place where you can organize very different events. And uh, the, the project I show here is uh, a technical school. So the issue was also to test, uh, let's say, uh, certain, let's say, new forms of education where you try to bring, uh, let's say, classical schoolroom education close to uh, let's say education and workshops because this kind of uh, relation is very important and the project was also meant as a sort of uh, invitation for the young generation to study a profession uh, let's say uh, uh, or to go for a profession in in in, in technique because uh, yeah it's very difficult to find people that are interested nowadays in in technical professions and the let's say the the school was was an initiative from the industry to promote also a technical profession and in that case it's built on a on a mine in in uh, uh, Genk it's close to Aachen and funny enough so the, we found out later so on the same uh, uh, spot where already Oswald Matthias Ungers designed once <laughs> once a project and that's the sort of master plan with a lot of uh, uh, let's say techno technology related activities and that's the design of the of the school it's 
quite a big building. It's 90 meter on that side and 150 meter in that side. It's basically consisting out of two flexible uh, factory halls with an, uh, let's say, atrium in the middle. And on top of that, there are classical uh, uh, school rooms, but the distance between the workshop and the school rooms is quite uh, short. And the idea t was to make a, a glass building with a, let's say, quite a fluent relation between inside and outside. And in order to do so, we designed everywhere these pergolas to keep the sun out of the, the structure. So we have a bit of sort of forest-like context with a school that presents itself like a huge uh, uh, pavilion, you could say. The pergola is eight meter high in that case. And you have these kind of workshop spaces with this view uh, on the landscape. Uh, uh, that are, let's say, very uh, flexible and adaptable to very different kind of uses. And you, you can see this axis, so you have these kind of two uh, industrial halls, you have a zone with the classrooms, and then in the middle you have this kind of atrium that works as a sort of social connector between the different parts of the institution. And uh, the atrium is set up in a way that we have on one, one uh, part, we have a public hall. On the other hand, we, on, the, on the other half, we have a sort of the restaurant that's a bit covered by, let's say, plateaus that connect the different uh, floors. And here again, the issue of, uh, let's say, cost is mostly in, in nowadays in a lot of uh, projects really a big item. So we had here prefabrication of 85% of all the uh, uh, components and uh, that's a bit how it looks from the from the outside so it's the entrance uh, piazza and then you have the main atrium in the middle you see the restaurant let's say a bit in the in the in the distance and for us let's say the funny thing was that uh, also the school let's say uh, can be uh, really a sort of public uh, venue. So they, 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 they organize a lot of, uh, let's say, events uh, in collaboration with the, with, the, with the industry and a lot of people basically go there because the space is all so big that you can uh, do quite a lot of uh, uh, stuff within uh, uh, the building. So at the end, it's not just a sort of education building, but also a meeting point for uh, a certain, uh, let's say, industry. And here's the, the view from the other side. So you see the, the restaurant in the front, and then you see these kind of plateaus that, let's say, all connect the different uh, floors. And for us, let's say, it was interesting. We have our office in the Fanella factory in, in Rotterdam, UNESCO World uh, Heritage, the building from the 19, 1920s with a lot of glass. And we try to work a bit in the same, let's say, with the same mindset. So we have this kind of restaurant. You are basically 45 meters away uh, from the facade, but you can still see here in the distance uh, the trees because of the fact that the, the separation walls are for big parts made out of glass, and that makes it actually still very pleasant. And uh, you have always also a bit the feeling where you, where you are. And uh, for us, it was also a sort of interesting uh, experiment in one hand, how to handle the, the scale. So how, yeah, how can you create situations that people really can identify? And for us, was, for instance, that was interesting. There's a sort of wall at the central core. And we brought in all these kind of meeting uh, places, and that are the most attractive places in the in the in the in in the in in, in the school. And then you see that, yeah, people really behave like animals. Right? It's quite funny. So you have a you have a place where you can sit. You are a little bit, it's a little bit like a nest, but you have the view on what is going on, and there is this moment of collectivity, but also a bit of privacy, and that works actually. Uh, quite an interesting way in, in, in within the structure. And what we also found for us was, let's say, interesting discovery. We really, for the first time, tried to make uh, classrooms that have glass on both sides. So we have a big window towards the outside, but also full glass on the, on the corridor. We were always a bit afraid if that would work. But uh, 
the distance, let's say, between, let's say, the, the classrooms that facing each other is like 17 meters, so there is not really so strong visual inter interaction, and the gangways are quite wide, and it works quite well, so the, so the users didn't blind the windows or didn't put curtains, but kept, basically, until now, the, the, the open structure. And here again, a bit, the way we work, and a bit the expression and the view from the outside. And the last project I would like to show is, again, a sort of uh, a, a concert hall, but uh, uh, this time it's quite a different uh, uh, take. It's a sort of uh, uh, building in uh, Antwerp, concert hall from the, from the 19th century, and the issue was here to uh, 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 do a restoration and extension and transformation of the existing thing. And we were actually basically, let's say, thrown in this kind of discussion about how to restore a concert hall or how to re restore a, a, a historic building, what is not uh, uh, easy. And uh, we were also confronted with the fact that, uh, let's say, the, the question is with these kind of public venues redesign, if they will be always uh, used <laughs> in the future in the way we imagine. Eh? That's also a question that we have, have asked ourselves, because what I always notice when I go to the classical concert, and I have it already since, I think, 15 years, that I always think when I go there, I'm the youngest. <laughs> and that has to do that, let's say, the, the whole concept of classical music, for instance, is quite under pressure, because uh, it's not so easy to inspire the younger generation to go to the opera and go to the classical concert. So the question is, what will happen to these places? And for instance, this is a f uh, an, an image of the famous uh, concert hall in, in Boston, where, yeah, where you see, I mean, they do their classical concerts, but they have also to do other stuff in order to uh, to survive. And uh, the problem we were facing in, in Antwerp was actually quite an interesting one because it's the, the concert hall is here and here's the, the famous Harmony uh, Park. It's a sort of uh, concert hall that was set up in the beginning of the 19th century and then transformed, I think, in 1890 to this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, building. But uh, basically the concert hall went bankrupt in 1920, so there was not enough need um, anymore. There was not so much interest in, 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 in classical music, and you have an opera house, and you have another concert hall, and that one was basically over. So, and the question was a bit what to do with this concert hall. And uh, when we came, it was like 10 years ago, the state, uh, the building looked like that, and uh, there were also some strange stuff. There was, for instance, this kind of pergola that was cutting through the, through the facade. And what we actually did, we tried to, let's say, reconstruct more or less the, let's say, the, the, the building with this kind of uh, neoclassicist idea in mind. And, but we had to, let's say, basically reconstruct a lot of elements that were not there anymore, like all the windows, all the balustrades, and so on. So it looks like an old building, but at the end, uh, we had actually to do a lot to make it look like an uh, 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 old building. And, uh, but it was actually quite nice because we learned a lot about, uh, let's say, uh, uh, restoration techniques and uh, and there's also some high tech here, like this kind of four meter high uh, wooden doors. It's not so easy to get that nowadays done because the quality of the wood is not as good as in the 19th century. But the main uh, design task was basically to find a new organization for the building. So that means the building was there, but our job was, or that was also the reason why we basically won the competition, was that we tried to organize the building in a way that you could have different uh, zones, but we tried basically to keep the original expression. So what we did was that. So we have, a, uh, you have the concert hall, there was another building, and we built behind uh, the concert hall a huge uh, corridor that would connect all the uh, places, and that would help to, let's say, uh, have different access zones for the building. So it's like a huge service corridor, and it was the, let's say, the way 
to, let's say, keep the, the historical spaces free from, uh, let's say, additional uh, uh, demands. And then you see a bit how it looks. So you have, for instance, here you see the, 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 the connection corridor, and then you have the old orangerie, and then the side facade of the, of the concert hall. And you see some specific problems we are facing. For instance, like we had this kind of nice steel construction from the 19th century, far too thin for conditions nowadays. So we had to construct a new roof and put the historical construction underneath. <laughs> so the, the real construction became basically a, a decoration. And partly the, the, the new corridor is filled in with uh, uh, meeting rooms and uh, additional spaces that were necessary for the building. But the main question was actually, the building was transformed in 1972 into a discotheque. So, <laughs> so the 19th century concert hall was basically gone. <laughs> that says also a lot about the culture in the, in the 1970s in Europe. That would be nowadays completely unthinkable to <laughs> turn a monument in something like that. And, uh, and the question was a bit during the competition what to do uh, with this kind of thing. But what was funny was that also the 1970 people were a bit lazy. So they <laughs> basically kept the historical <laughs> structure where, 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 where it was no problem. And that meant that we could remove the entire interior. But we were basically faced with the situation that we had uh, let's say, historical ceilings, but underneath everything was more or less gone. Eh? Like, uh, and then the question was a bit, yeah, how, what should we do with that? And we had a bit the idea to say, Naya, maybe uh, we try also to show, or let's say, keep this historic process a bit in mind, and we propose to have, a, let's say, a, a historical reconstruction of the entire ceiling, but to bring in a new interior on the uh, ground floor and the idea was to have, let's say we started with the idea to have a sort of monolithic uh, terrazzo floor without dilatations and came then up with the idea that the whole, the columns and the interior elements could be made out of concrete in order to give it a bit um, more solid character and that's a bit the, basically the, the point where the old is touching the new, so you see the reconstruction of the historic ceiling, and then we brought in this kind of new uh, prefab uh, uh, terrazzo columns that are, let's say, basically an abstraction of, let's say, historic uh, columns. And we also brought in new uh, doors, also again with uh, uh, terrazzo uh, cladding, and we put partly the installations along the, the ductwork along the wall and covered them with uh, concrete benches. So that means we have a sort of concrete uh, plinth situation everywhere. So you, because we had also to do acoustic uh, <laughs> cladding of the walls in order to get that under control. And we have a set of new elements that try to find somehow a dialogue with the, with the historic uh, structure. So you see a bit how that, uh, works and then we had also to bring in a new uh, auditorium and uh, to do a sort of acoustic renovation of the of the structure by bringing in this kind of elements that avoids that the noise can go straight into the uh, curved uh, ceiling and you have this kind of uh, let's say structure and then let's say we were uh, also facing with the issue that it's nice to reconstruct the building, but a building needs also a function. And it was quite clear that they, uh, that uh, uh, that there was not really a, a, a need for a new uh, public venue. So the idea was here to make a sort of uh, combination of a public venue and a public uh, facility. And um, in that case, uh, let's say we brought in uh, sort of infrastructure for the for the city offices, and the space is actually designed in a way that you uh, 
let's say on one end you still have the feeling of the classical concert hall, you can remove all the elements in the middle and uh, organize public events in the concert hall that are in interaction with the park. But at the same time, you can also use the space during the week as a, let's say, a public facility for the, for a, a city office for the citizens of Antwerp. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So it's quite, uh, it's quite, I think the discussion is really crazy. And l like I also mentioned about the natural stone, I mean, 20 years ago, natural stone was really evil. Yeah, you cut mountains and so on. Now natural stone, the best what you can do. So it's like, uh, it's also completely crazy. So in that way, I think, okay, you have to do, you have to try to, uh, to, to work in a sort of sensible way. I mean, I, I would agree with that. So we should try to, uh, make proper structures, but what is very often forgotten is that the, I, a, at least I believe that the best uh, quality for sustainability, uh, sustainability is on one hand to build less, so that is a critique on capitalism, so <laughs> let's say, because you can also say we build not so much, but <laughs> nobody wants to discuss that actually. But the other thing is also that what is important is, uh, is beauty, because when you look on, on the tradition of neoclassicism, I mean, all these kind of neoclassicistic buildings by Schinkel, they are all kept, and they are not kept because they are uh, super good in energy <laughs> or whatever, but they, they are kept because they are so flexible and they are also beautiful. Everybody wants to be in them, and the fact that you keep the buildings is the best sustainable thing what you can do, because we very often have these, I mean, that a lot of architects have it, we have a lot of commissions where we knock down an existing structure in order to build a new one, and basically, when you knock down something, you, uh, I mean, you lose so much that it's much, it makes much more sense to, uh, let's say, refurbish or restructure things than to build uh, new, uh, new buildings, let's say. And for sure, the discussion about glass, that is, that, that is always a sort of sensitive issue, but in our case, it's mostly that the buildings are so compact, so because we always think that the compactness is the most important thing, so when you make a compact structure, it's cheap, so it's very compact, you need the daylight, and uh, what we do now, very often, we do a lot of buildings at the moment with basically double, double skin, so we have balconies all around, or pergola, and so on, and then you can manage quite well with these uh, environmental uh, 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 conditions, but let's say, be, but we are let's say a bit rather a bit cynical about this kind of issue, a discussion about sustainability, because there is not really the perfect solutions, and you have to be very. Uh, it's better to be very conservative <laughs> and <laughs> do. A, and also, when you do renovations, you find out when you have existing buildings, then you find out what is uh, the quality you need. So you need a bit extra space height and more massive walls, but, and this kind of stuff, so. Because the pro a lot of problems we have basically nowadays is also because of this, yeah, basically of the idea of the, let's say, of modernism in combina combination with uh, real estate thinking, eh? So you do everywhere, the, the ceiling heights are too low, and because of that you get a lot of climate problems inside, because when you're building, when the ceiling height is higher, then it's not becoming so quickly so warm, eh? So. But that's a, I think it's a difficult uh, discussion, and I think that architects should be much more, uh, let's say, defend also their position, because if you leave it over to, to the industry, then you get even more <laughs> ventilations <laughs> and ductworks and so on, you know? So. Are there any other questions? Uh, we also have a glass of wine, and um, which we can now go to the bar next door. And uh, there will be our uh, third lecture on um, concert venues uh, next week from Snow Hetta, which I invite you all to tune in again or come along. And um, but for now, uh, let's join and thank again, uh, Oliver Till. Thank you very much. Thank you.